Chronic Exertional Compartment Syndrome, Diagnosis and Treatment. The complaint of leg pain is commonly seen in our athletes, particularly in runners and endurance sports. The pain is frequently exercise related, may be related to first impact, but usually proceeds with more and more in-depth participation in sports. Perhaps the most common term used is a relative wastebasket term of shin splints. Shin splints does not specify the specific diagnosis or guide treatment, and the use of the term should be discouraged. This leads us to a diagnostic dilemma of what is the source of leg pain in our athletes. There are various anatomic sources of potential leg pain. The bone itself has a potential of continuum of bone trauma existing from a bone strain to a stress reaction all the way to a stressed fracture or a completely displaced fracture. The periosteum itself may offer a secondary response to the underlying bone stress injury or may be irritated itself secondary to muscle insertions or chronic diffuse inflammation. Additional anatomic sources include the muscles themselves, which may be prone to muscle strains, and indeed separate muscle compartments, each wrapped by independent fascia that separates out four to five separate muscle compartments in the lower extremity. These can trap the injured muscles within this fascia, and bleeding can lead to acute or chronic exertional compartment syndromes. Additional sources of potential leg pain include nerve injury, either from proximal in the spine or in and about the hip with radicular pain distally into the leg, systemic diseases which lead to neuropathy, or secondary to direct trauma in the leg itself, that is, due to compression or direct injury. Anatomic sources of leg pain also include the vascular system itself, with atherosclerosis leading to claudication in elderly patients, venous phlebitis secondary to disuse, extended sitting or blood coagulopathy problems, as well as the relatively rare problem of popliteal artery entrapment, lower arterial endofibrosis which can mimic a deep posterior exertional compartment syndrome. Therefore, the differential diagnosis of chronic leg pain in athletes is rather extensive, including chronic exertional compartment syndrome, muscle herniations, stress fractures, medial tibial periostitis, commonly known as shin splints, chronic muscle strains, popliteal artery entrapment, and pain referred from the spine. Clearly, although those diagnoses are the most common in our athletic population, we cannot forget the significant but rare and unusual diagnoses including osteosarcoma or other tumors, trauma and abuse, infection including TB, syphilis, bacterial and fungal or metabolic sources such as rickets, hyperparathyroidism, sarcoid, sickle cell or Paget's disease. These issues are much less commonly seen in athletes, but we must be astute. Clearly, common things are common, and if we hear hoofbeats, we should look for horses, but we should not forget the zebras. Chronic exertional compartment syndrome was defined by Leversedge in 2002 in the American Journal of Sports Medicine as an effort-induced pathologic elevation of tissue pressures within an osteofascial envelope that results in debilitating pain and neurologic symptoms. It appears in athletes anywhere from 12 to 70 years old, most commonly in runners or endurance sports, but it may occur in soccer, cycling, gymnastics, basketball, rollerblading, and dance. Compartment syndromes have been discussed in the past, and generally we can break them down into traumatic versus exertional types. Traumatic are usually secondary to a fracture, crush injury, or possibly reperfusion injury secondary to leg replantations or digit replantations. Traumatic compartment syndromes and acute compartment syndromes are a surgical emergency. The fascia and skin must be released to allow reperfusion of the muscles, nerves, and tissues of the lower extremity. With acute compartment syndromes, the skin, fascia, and even splinting material all can be restrictive and must be released as part of the treatment. In contrast, exertional compartment syndromes are pain-free at rest. They are generally exercise-induced, more common in endurance athletes, and their restriction is primarily attributed to the tight fascial compartments. Surgical treatment, therefore, does not require complete release of the skin, but rather a release of the fascia itself. Confirmation is usually made with pre- and post-exertion intracompartment pressure measurements. A number of clinical pearls or clues can guide the examiner into making the specific diagnosis of leg pain in athletes. Pain with initial impact is consistent with a stress fracture, periostitis, muscle strains, and tendinitis.
Focal bone pain, or one that you can cover with just a single finger or with your thumb, is most consistent with a stress fracture. Diffuse, especially on the medial posterior border of the tibia bone pain, is consistent with medial tibial periostitis. Focal pain more isolated in the muscle, commonly associated with the localized swelling, may be secondary to a muscle herniation or possibly a muscle strain. For muscle strains, most of these injuries are at the muscle tendon junction, which is the weak link in the motor unit. Pain with resisted motion is consistent with injury to the muscle tendon unit, muscle strains, or potentially the muscle insertion onto the bone and periostitis. A number of authors have also discovered and reported that vibrational activities appear to exacerbate the pain of stress fractures. Therefore, treatment with ultrasound or simply placing a tuning fork along the subcutaneous border of the tibia will significantly exacerbate the pain in a very focal area. Pain at night is concerning for the potential of tumors, and pain with exertion is fairly classic for chronic exertional compartment syndrome or popliteal artery entrapment syndrome. Numbness at rest or paresthesias at rest are consistent with some type of nerve entrapment or potential proximal radiculopathy. Paresthesias with exertion should raise concern of chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Electrical shooting pain, primarily from the upper extremity or back, is consistent with a disc or more proximal radiculopathy. By inspection, diffuse swelling may be indicative of a deep venous thrombus, and it could be associated with chronic exertional compartment syndrome or muscle ruptures. Muscle ruptures should have a palpable defect somewhere along the muscle tendon unit. More localized or focal swelling may be indicative of a ganglion, a tumor, or more commonly in athletes, a muscle herniation. Muscle herniation can be directly associated with chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Physical examination of the lower extremity, particularly focused on the leg, includes inspection, palpation, muscle resistance, neurovascular evaluation, weight bearing, ambulation, jumping, and stair climbing. Examination should begin with having the patient simply stand for inspection of the relative position of the foot and pronation or supination. If they can stand single-legged and with two-legged stance, they should be asked to rise up on their tiptoes, rise on the heels, and then they can be asked to actually jump and impact directly on their heels. Each of these are assessed for the cause of pain. We then ask the patient to ambulate with careful inspection of their ability to walk with their toes raised as well as up on their tiptoes. Toe walking and duck walking, it has been argued, that if a patient is able to do this, 95% of motor and neuro function are completely intact. Inspection and function should be evaluated both from the front, from the side, and from the rear. Once again, standing up on the tiptoes, standing back on the heels to evaluate flexion and extension strength. Asking the athlete to jump and land directly onto the heels is an excellent clue to suggest the effect of direct impact and percussion. We would expect that a stress fracture would cause exacerbated pain with that. Looking from the rear, it is often much easier to evaluate the pronation and supination position of the foot. Additionally, the use of props as stair stepping stools can be helpful to evaluate power as well as evaluate some pain in the forefoot. Asking the patient to hang his heels off of the step, as well as then repetitively doing step ups and step downs, will help evaluate strength as well as any difficulty with stair climbing that might exacerbate some of the pain. More directly, the physical examination is made by evaluating nerve and motor function, having the patient wiggle their toes, extending the extensor hallucis longus against resistance, you can identify and palpate along the EHL all the way to the dorsum of the foot and see if there is tenderness and pain in there.
Resistance of the entire foot can then be evaluated over the anterior tibialis. Resistance of the four lateral toes can evaluate the extensor digitorum, which can all easily be palpated. The dorsal pedal arteries should be palpated for a good brisk pulse. Posterior tibial pulse can also be evaluated just posterior to the medial malleolus. Having the patient resist external rotation and lateral motion of the foot should let the perineal tendons become much more prominent just posterior to the lateral fibula. Pain or popping in this area may indicate unstable perineal tendons that are popping in and out of place. More proximally, we would want to evaluate the source of the common perineal nerve as it passes just about the proximal aspect of the lateral fibula, and with a little bit of a squeeze on the mid portion of the muscle fascia, there is a small indentation where it is actually visible, indicative of the refei between the anterior and lateral compartments of the leg. Palpation along the entire surface of the anterior compartment and lateral compartment are helpful. With resisted dorsiflexion or external rotation of the foot, sometimes as you palpate along the anterior compartment, a prominence may be appreciated, indicative of either muscle herniation or tenderness in the area where the superficial perineal nerve comes out and can cause pain. Patients should be checked both in the supine and in the prone position. Prone position allows better palpation of the Achilles. Once again, posterior tibial artery and nerve can be palpated, and palpation along the entire flexor mechanism of the Achilles tendon is important. Indeed, looking for a defect or focal tenderness at the muscle tendon junction can be indicative of an Achilles tendon injury. Usually the clinical exam for compartment syndrome is normal unless there is a muscle herniation. The diagnostic criteria for compartment syndrome is intracompartmental pressure testing. This is done with a striker monitor. After prepping the skin with betadine, the needle is placed directly through the skin through two separate punctures into the anterior and lateral compartment and then posteromedially into the posterior compartment. The skin can be anesthetized with topical spray such as ethyl chloride or an injection with a small needle of lidocaine. All four compartments should be routinely measured in both legs before and after exercise. Normal pressures are up to 10 millimeters of mercury. Abnormal pressures include resting pressures greater than 15, post-exertion pressures greater than 30, and delayed pressure greater than 20. The four compartments are anterior, lateral, superficial, and deep posterior. A fifth separate compartment for the posterior tibialis has been described. Although chronic exertional compartment syndrome is rare in this fifth compartment and testing is not routinely performed, consider involvement if pain is deep posterior and not improving despite treatment. All four compartments should be tested. Typically, the anterior and anterolateral compartments are involved in chronic exertional compartment syndrome. The cross-sectional diagram shows the nerves in the compartments, including the superficial perineal nerve laterally, the deep perineal nerve anteriorly. The posterior tibial nerve is in the deep posterior compartment. The superficial posterior compartment houses the medial sural cutaneous nerve deep to the fascia, and the lateral sural cutaneous nerve is superficial to the fascia. The typical muscles involved in chronic exertional compartment syndrome are in the anterior compartment, extensor digitorum longus, tibialis anterior, and extensor hallucis longus, and posterior to the inner muscular septum in the lateral compartment, the perineus longus and perineus brevis. The inner muscular septum acts as the boundary between the anterior and lateral compartments for testing as well as release. The posterior compartments are divided into deep and superficial. The deep posterior compartment houses the flexor hallucis longus, flexor digitorum longus, and superficial gastrocnemius and soleus. A fifth compartment housing the posterior tibialis has been described. Pre-exercise testing is performed after the skin is cleansed with betadine and local anesthesia used. Once the needle is in place, a small amount of fluid is passed down the syringe so that consistent fluid level is appreciated by the device throughout its entire course. 
Once this is performed, you can read the measurement off, and when it stabilizes, this gives you the pressure in the compartment. All four compartments are routinely measured. The athlete is asked to exercise on a treadmill and then returns immediately to the clinic for retesting. The skin is reanesthetized with ethyl chloride or lidocaine and compartment testing is repeated. Increase in pressures by 15 millimeters of mercury are suggestive of compartment syndrome. The athlete must have reached a level of symptoms or the test is not conclusive. To summarize, at rest, compartment pressures should be less than 15 millimeters of mercury. If there is elevation of up to 25 or 30, this is considered positive. A delayed five-minute repeat examination that still remains over 20 is considered elevated and indicative of chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Ultimately, when the compartment pressures are noted to be positive, there are a number of treatment options. Historically, the literature has shown attempts at non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, massage, rest, stretching and strengthening, as well as other modalities. These have had a very poor outlook for returning the patient to sport. Indeed, ultimately rest and giving up the sport can be effective, but is usually not the choice of our athletes. We have noted in a number of cases that shoe orthotic and surface modifications have provided relief of leg complaints and obviated the need to perform a fascial release. These generally are with patients with very mild elevations that are likely secondary to the overuse and stress injuries that are causing the increased swelling in the muscle compartment. Once those are addressed, the pressures then come back down to a more normal level and do not create the ischemic pain of chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Ultimately, for most athletes, the treatment of pressure-proven chronic exertional compartment syndrome is fascial release. You must always rule out associated factors or diagnoses to make sure the patient is optimally treated. There are a number of surgical techniques available to treat compartment syndrome. Formal fascial release with wide open skin incisions are indicated for acute compartment syndromes, but are not necessary for chronic exertional compartment syndromes. Fasciectomies must be performed under a complete open incision and probably are not indicated in chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Percutaneous releases through small incisions and a long fasciotome have been proposed by a number of authors with good success. However, these are done somewhat blindly and concern has been raised regarding the safety of injuring cutaneous tissues as well as other veins and vessels. Other authors have suggested dual incision mini approaches, single incision mini approaches, and endoscopically assisted fascial releases. The development of endoscopically assisted fascial release, the first described case report was in an article by Otto and others out of arthroscopy in 1999, where they used infrared spectroscopy to help make the diagnosis, and then offered an endoscopically assisted release in one case. Also in 1999, Havig and Leversedge in the Journal of Hand Surgery performed an in vitro study of forearm fascial releases using endoscopic assistance. They followed up that study in 2002 with a cadaveric study of a two incision endoscopic technique for fascial release of the legs in chronic exertional compartment syndrome. They argued that the two incision technique was safer than the single incision technique. For us, the development of endoscopically assisted fascial releases for chronic exertional compartment syndrome began in 1996 when we performed our first procedure on a young athlete in an aesthetically demanding sport. Our goal was to use any device available to help minimize the incision to help minimize the scar and the look on her leg. As mentioned previously, she was able to successfully return to sport and subsequently we began to study the safety and efficacy of a single incision endoscopically assisted fascial release on embalmed and fresh cadaveric studies from 1999 to 2000. In those studies we were able to identify that the length of release varied significantly both with percutaneous and endoscopic technique with a broad standard deviation of range. Indeed, compared to the subsequent open dissection, these generally represented probably only 70 to 80 percent of a complete release of the fascial compartments.
Regarding the safety and efficacy compared to percutaneous techniques, none of our legs in the endoscopic group sustained an injury to the superficial perineal nerve, while four out of six legs in the percutaneous group did. This was felt to confirm the impression that an endoscopic procedure would be a safer procedure regarding the superficial perineal nerve. Regarding the release of the medial structures and deep posterior compartments, endoscopically assisted fascial releases provided injury to the saphenous vein with a complete transection in one out of ten of our patients, and three out of the remaining ten had injuries to significant branches of the saphenous vein, compared to the percutaneous technique in which 67 percent of the legs sustained a complete transection or longitudinal laceration of the saphenous vein. These findings suggest that the saphenous vein is the most commonly injured structure for approach to the medial aspect for endoscopic release, and indeed has discouraged us from performing any endoscopic or percutaneous releases of the deep posterior and superficial posterior compartments. If we are required to release these areas, they are done under a much wider exposure to avoid injury to these structures. Essential equipment for the endoscopic technique includes long thin retractors, a zero or 30 degree endoscope, arthroscopic electrocautery, and extended Metzenbaum scissors or a fasciotome. We had modified large chest tubes, cutting a split out of them to use as our retractor down the small incision as suggested by Otto and others. However, we found these difficult to place and could not consistently maintain the patency of our inferior slit through which we could perform the fasciotomy. We have found it much easier to use a long thin retractor in which the assistant pulls laterally, keeping the skin and subcutaneous tissue well out of field. This allows us to place our endoscope up the canal and provide adequate visualization to assist in the extent of our release. The actual procedure is performed again by squeezing the anterior lateral compartments. As you squeeze them together you can find a small indentation where you can make a mark that is midway between the lateral fibula and lateral malleolus. The small incision is made approximately two to three centimeters in length longitudinally and skin and subcutaneous tissue are dissected down to the fascia. Assuming that you have identified things well you should be able to see the raffe of the intermuscular septum easily through this area and then a longitudinal incision is made in the fascia just anterior and posterior to the raffe. Above the level of the fascia, both proximally and distally, the long Metzenbaum scissors are used to separate the fascia through the subcutaneous tissue. This is done bluntly with spreading and without cutting. Longitudinal fascial incisions are made anteriorly and posteriorly into the anterior compartment and posterior compartment. These should be placed approximately two to three millimeters away from the raffe to avoid injury to any vessels in that area. Next, the long Metzenbaum scissors are placed within the fascial compartment through these small longitudinal cuts and then carefully bluntly spread to separate the muscles from the undersurface of the fascia so that there is no catching. The compartment releases themselves are placed after placing a long retractor with your assistant pulling traction away. The initial approximately two to three centimeters are basically the endoscope which is being used as a flashlight but more distally the endoscope is placed the retractor is towed in to allow excellent visualization and allow us particularly distally to identify the superficial perineal nerve as it exits we protect that area with direct visualization with the endoscopic view looking for the nerve as it penetrates As you can see on the endoscopic view, we are taking our Metzenbaum scissors beneath the level of the fascia to release that level, making sure the muscle is nicely separated from it. As long as our assistant is retracting, we have a very nice space to be working through. We then take our scissors and carefully push cut under endoscopic visualization. This should be done very slowly so that if any bleeders are visualized, you immediately stop pushing and get the long electrocautery bovi, the arthroscopic bovi, to control the bleeding. This can be done down to the level distally until you see the nerve, and you can sometimes go around or under to release the nerve as it passes through its hiatus.
Immediately at the end of the case, you should place your finger into the wound and evaluate approximately and distally to make sure you have an adequate release of your fascia distally as long as your finger can reach both proximally and distally. Over the last five years, we have now performed approximately 20 to 25 extremities for endoscopically assisted fascial releases for chronic exertional compartment syndrome. With that, we have been able to identify the superficial perineal nerve. We had no superficial perineal nerve injuries. The medial releases have been performed only when indicated so that the pressures were elevated, and when they were performed, they were not performed with endoscopic assistance. They were performed with the wider open procedure. We had no significant hematomas that required drainage or significant post-operative cellulitis. Perioperatively, we will use antibiotics for approximately 48 to 72 hours, secondary to the increased risk of cellulitis with the significant subcutaneous dissection that was performed. Of our athletes, we had 13, 7 of which had bilaterals. 12 of 13 returned to full sport. Reviewing the literature, Mavers described the first successful surgical release of chronic exertional compartment syndrome in 1956. Detmer has approximately the largest consecutive series of fascial releases, noting 100 patients, 82 of which were bilateral, with a 90% success as an outpatient under local anesthesia with percutaneous techniques. Forneck has described in 18 patients 87% bilaterality, and interestingly 39% with an associated fascia herniation. His results showed 92% successful results with a surgical release. In 1999, Dr. Lyle McKeeley produced a study evaluating fascial releases for chronic exertional compartment syndrome, noting that the successes appeared to be reduced in female athletes compared to male athletes. Regarding the effect on age, Garcia Mata in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics in 2001 presented a series of 23 adolescents, age range 14 to 18, in which they performed percutaneous fascial releases. They reported no complications and a 100% success rate of returning them to sport. This would argue that this procedure can be performed successfully in a younger age group. What is unclear is in the extremely young age group, is it something that they might just outgrow? The fascia defect is outlined by the circle. This is the proposed skin incision with the landmarks. The proximal fibula, the lateral malleolus, and the two incision technique is outlined. The two incisions are spaced at approximately the junction of the proximal and middle thirds and the middle and distal thirds. Each incision is two centimeters. Dissection is carried down through the skin with a 15 blade down to the fascia which is visualized in the intramuscular septum. Here in the distal incision, the superficial perineal nerve was readily identified as it exited through the fascial defect. Here you could see a nerve hook probing the nerve. The subcutaneous tissue was dissected off of the fascia, both above and below the fascia, with Metzenbaum scissors. Once we are certain that the soft tissue is cleared, both from the anterior and lateral compartment, we will go ahead with our fascial release. The first fascial release begins from the distal incision and is brought proximally. An endoscope is placed through the proximal incision for visualization of the passage of the Metzenbaum scissors. A complete fascial release is obtained. Any superficial nerves or blood vessels are preserved. Once the fascial release in the anterior and lateral compartments is complete in the mid portion, it is released distally down to the extensor retinaculum, and a similar procedure is done from the proximal incision up to the fibular head. The entire procedure is done without a tourniquet, and a hemostasis is achieved prior to closing the wounds with sutures. The TV screen should be set up so that the surgeon can well visualize the nerve and release. Approximately 40% of exertional compartment syndrome cases have a fascial herniation.
If it's present, look for the superficial perineal nerve exiting there. Begin your release at that level. Never close the fascia. An example of the youngest athlete reported in the literature with a chronic exertional compartment syndrome is a 12-year-old premenarchal elite-level rhythmic gymnast. She presented with bilateral leg pain, absent at rest, absent with first impact, but building up with exertion. This is a fairly common presentation. She failed numerous sources of physical therapy, and imaging workup was completely negative. Again, this is a fairly common presentation for chronic exertional compartment syndrome. Ultimately, intercompartment measurements were evaluated, and resting all were less than 15, but with exertion, elevations were noted, particularly in the anterior and lateral compartments. At 12 years old, this patient introduces a significant question in the treatment of chronic exertional compartment syndrome, and that is, is it possible that she will simply grow out of it? It is possible, but the athlete presented was on the junior national team and eager to continue her competition. She could not continue her competition with her complaints as they were and did not want to wait for complete skeletal maturity as she would lose a significant portion of her career. Therefore, she and her family elected to proceed with an endoscopically assisted fascial release of her compartments, and she had excellent results. This 18-year-old freshman collegiate basketball athlete was seen for complaints of pain, numbness, tingling, and burning in both of his calves, left greater than right. On physical exam, the calves were soft, neurocirculatory was intact. Family history was interesting in that the patient's brother had had bilateral four-compartment releases done one year before his presentation. The differential diagnosis included exertional compartment syndrome, left greater than right leg, stress fracture of the left tibia. Plain radiographs were normal. Initially, the patient was started on a program of passive stretching and reduction of his running activities. He was at a different level of school with changes in his training program. Two months later, the patient returned with continued symptoms. Examination was essentially unchanged. He underwent striker intracompartmental testing before and after exercise. The compartment pressures were significantly elevated post-exercise in the anterior compartment. On the more symptomatic left side, he went from 20 at rest to 42 after exercise, on the right side from 8 to 62. Since his posterior compartment on the more symptomatic left was normal resting pressure at 8 and post-exercise 16, the posterior compartment was not measured on the right. A clear diagnosis of elevated post-exercise compartment testing led to compartment releases. The anterior and lateral compartments were released via a one incision technique. The superficial perineal nerve was seen through the incision as noted on the left. A single incision was used, retractors inserted, elevator was used to identify the fascia and the intramuscular septum. The subcutaneous tissue was spread proximally and distally. An incision was made through the fascia in a transverse direction. Probing shows the normal muscle. After the above fascial plane was established, the plane deep to the fascia was established in both the anterior and the lateral compartment. Long Metzenbaum scissors are used to spread. The superficial perineal nerve is at risk distally. The endoscopic visualization helps to reduce injury to the superficial perineal nerve. Metzenbaum scissors are used after the above and below fascia is spread and release is done. Endoscopic visualization after release is performed. Care is taken to make sure the release of the anterior and the lateral compartment is complete. The normal appearing muscle is seen. This was done without tourniquet control. Irrigation of the wound was done. The fibula distal and proximal is used as a landmark. The intramuscular septum is well visualized and used as a landmark to identify the boundary between the anterior and lateral compartments.
The scope is inserted into the wound without irrigation. Long instruments of Metzenbaum and retractors enable visualization with less risk of bleeding or injury to the superficial perineal nerve. Post-operatively, the patient did well, was partial weight-bearing on crutches for two weeks, walked normally at four weeks, and was running at two months. At six months post-op, he had no complaints, he was playing basketball, and his compartments were soft without a bulge. This 13-year-old female soccer athlete was seen for bilateral calf pain, right greater than left, which began six months ago. Her complaints were knots and a firmness and a burning sensation in the lateral aspect of her calf after 15 minutes of running. On physical exam, she had no pain or firmness of the calf on palpation. There was a fascial defect bilaterally in the lateral distal third. Neurocirculatory status was intact. She had bilateral cavus feet. She underwent striker compartment testing. Her resting anterior compartment on the right and her lateral compartment on the left were significantly elevated as shown. Posterior compartment pressures were normal. Noted was her fascial defect. She underwent a two incision release. Approximately the fascia is identified and distally the superficial perineal nerve was exiting through the fascial defect as shown. The probe pulls the superficial perineal nerve spreading above the fascia and deep to the fascia was done using the long Metzenbaum scissors. Incision of the fascia was then done starting distal and going proximally. The nerve was well visualized as it exited the fascia and care was taken not to injure the superficial perineal nerve. The anterior and lateral compartments were released. The arthroscope was used to make sure of the adequacy of the release. Going more distally, the fascia was released to the tendon junction laterally and anteriorly. No tourniquet was used. Proximally, the release was performed as well. The patient is doing well postoperatively. The pain has improved. She has not yet returned to activities. When there is a fascial defect, look for the superficial perineal nerve exiting as shown in this surgical photograph. When this is visualized this well, it is much less likely to be injured. A similar two incision technique was done on the left side. The bleeding was controlled using electrocautery postoperatively. At two weeks post-op, the patient is already improved and there is minimal swelling of her right or left leg. This 19-year-old freshman Division I collegiate cross-country and distance track athlete was seen for complaints of pain in both of her calves after running, which began two months after she was at school. She began cross-country competition at age 10 and won three state titles. She had had no previous problems. She was running more miles and on concrete and under a new coach. On physical exam, she had no firmness to her compartments or tibia on palpation. Her pulses were normal, as was her neurologic exam. Her previous workup had included normal tibiofibular x-rays, normal bone scan, normal lumbar spine radiographs, and lumbar MRI. Previous resting pressures were 12 in the lateral compartment and 10 in the posterior compartment, which was done with an indwelling needle. 
She was asked to run in an attempt to reproduce her symptoms, but this was not possible due to the pain of the indwelling needle. She was never able to reproduce her symptoms. The compartment testing was redone at rest and it took her 45 minutes of running on a treadmill to have symptoms occur. Her striker compartment pressures were slightly elevated on the left side in the anterior and lateral compartment, but decreased after exercise of 45 minutes of running. The compartment testing is shown. Due to the compartment pressures actually going down after exercise, compartment release was not suggested and assessment of the patient's running style and core stability was done. She is felt to be a rear foot striker and core weakness was noted. She had weakness of her hip abductors and external rotators on her right greater than left. She was treated with modification of her running program, a core strengthening program which included strengthening of her hip, back, and abdomen. The patient's balance is shown doing simple mini squats on the right and then on the left. The weakness is greater on the right than left as evidenced by her end balance and her femur going into internal rotation and adduction. From watching her run from the back on the left and the front on the right, a Trendelenburg type running was seen where her left posterior iliac crest drops as she strikes on the right. This is indicative of core instability and weakness of her hip adductors and external rotators. Conclusions The diagnosis of compartmental testing before and after exercise. The broad range of diagnoses for athletes with leg pain must be considered. Make sure of the diagnosis prior to surgical release. One must know the anatomy before performing compartment testing or surgical releases. Typically, chronic exertional compartment syndrome involves the anterior and the lateral compartments. The superficial perineal nerve may cause paresthesias on presentation and must be visualized and protected at the time of surgery. From the cosmetic and aesthetic standpoint, patients judge you by your wound. Minimal incisions are visually appealing. All females with chronic exertional compartment syndrome express particular interest in minimal incisions. Combination of the arthroscope and long retractors and long scissors optimizes visualization and reduces risk of superficial perineal nerve injury and bleeding. The superficial perineal nerve should always be visualized. Diagnosis must be confirmed by compartment pressure measurements. Avoid release of the posterior compartments unless there are documented symptoms and elevated posterior deep and superficial posterior compartment pressures. Diligent intraoperative bleeding control without tourniquet and postoperative cryotherapy must be implemented. All healthcare providers should have increased awareness of the problem of compartment syndrome. Does minimal incision surgery allow adequate faster release and what is an adequate release? The endoscopic visualization allows for adequate fascial release. The future will hold non-invasive testing to confirm the diagnosis of compartment syndrome, such as near-infrared spectroscopy. Thank you very much for your interest in diagnosis and treatment of athletes with chronic exertional compartment syndrome.